tutors, mentors, and the city with your host.com. The City Tutors presents Tutors, Mentors, and the City with your host.com. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Tutors, Mentors, and the City. And we have a very special guest. So I'm going to say this for full disclosure. Uh, I did, that wasn't the first name that I wanted to choose. I wanted the name to be Tutors, Mentors, and Dragons, right? <laughs> because I think when you add dragons to any title, it just makes it way cooler. No, nobody liked that idea. <laughs> nobody, <laughs> nobody received that idea. So we're stuck with the city. Uh, but that being said, I am so excited. And to quote, uh, Mike Myers from the Wayne's World movies. We're not worthy. We're not <laughs> worthy. We're not worthy of our first or our our guest for this episode. She is, I'm gonna let her tell you who she is, but please give a nice warm welcome to Miss Dee Dee Mozaleski. Thank you, thank you. Now we're just gonna jump in free-flowing conversation and it's about you so a lot of people could probably guess my first question but i'm here's the first question dd and mozaleski explain <laughs> those names okay all right so dd dd's a nickname um it's uh my real name is daleski so it is Daliski Mozaleski, but it gets worse. It's actually Daliski and Aleski Mozaleski. And I will tell you that my mom, um, who is who is black, met the one Polish person named Mozaleski to her Daliski, came together and thought, wouldn't it be a riot if we named our kid Daliski and Aleski Mozaleski? So you can imagine how popular I was growing up. Right? So the Didi it is. Didi it is. Dee, Dee, you know, we could probably end the interview after that. <laughs> That's the show, folks. That's it. <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. And thank you for That's joining right. us. <laughs> Holy cow. Okay. Okay. So um, what's, the, what's that first name again? Daliski. And it is a very tiny town in Russia. Um, my mom was named by her aunt. Her aunt named her after someone who immigrated from Russia after World War II. Um, and she named her after the city that the woman was from. So wow. random, a random Daleski walking down the streets in San Diego met a random Mozaleski. Like, wh what are the chances, right? Wow. Okay. Okay. So I'm sure you were a popular kid growing are you, up. Are you can't even imagine. Like, no no kid ever made fun of my name. No, not one would. <laughs> okay. So, so uh, Dee Dee, who are you? So I am, first of all, I'm a mom of a City College graduate. I think that's the most important thing that I've done. Um, but my, my day job is I'm in charge of a, a, a pretty random office now, government affairs, um, development, communications, workforce development, and innovation for the college. And I also serve as our college's uh, senior president's senior advisor for the campus. So all those things mean that um, I come to work every day thinking about City College and how to make sure our students succeed here. Wow. OK. OK. Well, you know, I come to City College every day thinking about City College yeah. also. And, but I don't have all those fly titles. So very. <laughs> I'll, I'll give any of them that you want. I'll, I'll gladly hand over to you. You got it. We'll talk offline. Well, good, good. We, we will definitely talk. We will definitely talk. OK, so uh, let's go back. Let's go back to your background. Where were you born? Where are you from? I am from San Diego, California. I am one of two siblings. Um, my entire family is from Lafayette, Louisiana, and that family moved west after World War II. So I grew up on a Navy base. Uh, my dad was in the military for 35 years, and um, I moved here in 1992. And I need to tell you that my ex-husband said to me, San Diego and New York are just alike. You're going to love it. And he brought me here in June. And in June, they are alike. And by November, they were very much not alike. <laughs> <laughs> but there was no internet there for me to uh, to verify the accuracy of his 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 stories. So <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So um, you you said you were born in in, in San Diego, California. San Diego, California. Yes. Public school, private school. All public school. Tr All straight public. to college. Yeah. Okay. And what did you do growing up? What you what were your hobbies? 
So I, I will be honest, and I read this recently, that if you can swim, if you can play an instrument, if you can speak a foreign language, and if you took summer vacations, you have a point of privilege that you don't realize you had. Um, I grew up, um, my mom was divorced when I was young. So I'm a welfare kid through and through. I still identify that way sometimes. Um, I do play the clarinet. So that was a hobby. And I don't think I got a hobby until high school. I picked up volleyball and volleyball took me straight through college. So, really? Yeah. So if you count riding your bike and going to the library as hobbies, then that's what I did growing up. But for the most part, you know, I, I was, I was quite the reader and I was quite the loner growing up. Mm -hmm. And where'd you go to college? San Diego State. I'm a proud Aztec. Oh. Okay. Uh, what was your college experience like? So I worked almost full-time hours while I was in college. Most of my time on campus was there at nighttime. Um, I would leave the place I worked. I would shoot over to the campus. I would hope to stay awake during my, my, uh, my four years there. And I studied business. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I actually thought I was going to join the Marine Corps. And my recruiter on my high school graduation day said, this is not for you. Your, your, um, your sense of justice is too high. And, and this isn't a good fit for a woman in the Marine Corps. Um, so, so I applied to college, got in and didn't know what to do. Someone said, you should take business. So I took business. I had no idea what that meant. I was the first person to go to college. There was nobody helping me navigate the conversation. And San Diego State must have taken a, taken a little bit of pity on me while I navigated the adult, the adult process of college education. Sometimes well, sometimes not well. Okay. Okay. So you, you went to college, majored in business and you got a bachelor's that's bachelor's degree, right? I got a bachelor's degree in business administration um, from the same school that Tony Gwynn, the famous baseball player went to. So proud Tony Gwynn, a con connection there. Yes. And then uh, maybe a week after graduation, we'd moved to New York and I was pretty sure I was going to go to social work school. So um, I took the very first job I was offered here working at a drug rehab center um, and stayed there for about four years. And a board member said to me, you know, we love you, but we don't think social work is for you. Again, your sense of justice is a little too high. Um, so I thought, well, what am I, <laughs> now what? Um, and they introduced me to a wonderful woman who became my mentor for 13 years. Um, and I went to work for uh, two different university systems. Um, and so, you know, it's a lear learning experience, right? Mm -hmm. experience, so. So here, so here I am. Um, but I, I will say that sense of justice is always what that was the defining point in my in my decisions around jobs. I think it served me pretty well. Maybe not back then as a 16 year old <laughs> or 20 year old, but definitely now it served me well. So two, two entities yeah. said to you, <laughs> yeah. your it's sense of justice too high. Is too high. <laughs> no. what you Sure. What were you doing to demonstrate this high sense I, of justice? I just, you, you, okay, so, you know, it's, so Marine Corps was easy, right? In, in 1989, women couldn't do a lot of jobs in the Marine Corps. And they were coming out of lots and lots of scandals in the military around how women were being treated. So, so I understand that. Um, we were a private agency on the drug and alcohol rehab side, working with city and state agencies. And the funding model didn't work. So I was constantly arguing with the city and state over like increasing the funding to support, in some cases, 14 year olds who were addicted to heroin. And, you know, they have to have a place to go when they finish this place. So I, so I think that's what they meant, that, that I was always going to be crushed by someone saying there is nothing for this group of people. Um, and I just thought that that can't be right. Like that, you don't get like that can't be true that I'm going to be burned out by this. Um, and they were wrong. I just want to be really clear. They they were wrong, but but it helped me think about how to shape conversations when I got older. So. Okay, so you moved to New York. What borough did you choose? The Bronx. Really? Is there another borough? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know about your listeners, but the Bronx. Um. <laughs> I'm a Bronx dude. I'm born and raised. I'm born and raised in the Bronx. Yeah. 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 Wow. I don't hear that 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 often. I yeah. typically hear people come to New York and they land in Brooklyn. No, nope. is what I typically hear. No, nope, Marble Hill and the Kingsbridge area. That's where we settled. And um, and we'd, we'd probably still be there if I hadn't gotten divorced. Um, I think I think two things happened. Um, we had someone who was murdered in front of our building in front of us. And mm -hmm. and then, you know, I, we got married young. So we were growing apart pretty quickly. Um, and we accidentally moved to Yonkers. And I've been in Yonkers ever since. But absolutely, the Bronx was home base for, for a number of years here. 
Okay, so you weren't far from the other CUNY school. I was yeah. not. I was actually right. I was in the shadow of Lehman College. That's exactly okay. Right. Yeah. Okay, and you moved to Yonkers. Um, that's in uh, being someone that that was born and raised in the Bronx. Uh, Yonkers and Upper Bronx. There's not much difference to no, to us. That's exactly right. 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 <laughs> to us, exactly. not much difference. Okay. Now, I grew up. I grew up in um in hip hop, right? I grew up in hip hop was being developed outside my window as a kid. So uh, a lot of my, a lot of my um, memories are rooted in, in the hip hop development. So if it weren't for the, there were, there were a specific group of artists that were, that came up in the Bronx where hip hop was being created. And then there was another group, a little bit younger, that came up from Yonkers, yes. like Mary J. Blige right. and P. Right. Diddy and those, that crew. So yeah. that's what created the distinction in my mind, right? But um, in, also in my mind, people from Yonkers had money, I, right? No one told me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I'd known. <laughs> yeah, I, I found out I was wrong. But in my mind, I was born and raised in the projects in New York City housing. And uh, anybody that lived in the house, was wealthy yes, right. to us, right? right? You know, the young mentality. But okay, so uh, you you and your husband split because your sense of justice was too high. I, it, that may have played a role as well. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, can I tell you, I was 19 when we got married and he was 20. And we got married right before he left for Desert Storm. And we weren't the same people when he came back from Desert Storm. And, and But we weren't smart enough to know that, you know? Right. Um, but we came together and we have a fantastic daughter um, who, who we wouldn't have had if we had done something different. So n- no complaints. I wouldn't undo it. But we were we were babies. We were just how old is your daughter? She is turning 30 in two weeks. You know, we have a very similar story. My daughter is 28 or something. <gasps> nice. And she's the she's the amazing thing that came out of uh, me and her mother's uh, union. And um me, me and her mother, her mother and I were best friends for six, seven, eight years before we got married. Nice. And as soon as we got married and she started taking advice from all the friends, the girlfriends about <laughs> what's what I'm supposed to do and what right. I'm not supposed to do. It went downhill from there. right? <laughs> but um, we we made the 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 greatest. I remember being disappointed when my daughter was born because I wanted a son so badly. And when I saw her, when she came out. And I laid eyes on her. It was like she just snatched my heart out my yeah. chest. Yeah. And I, I fell absolutely in love. And having a daughter was the greatest thing, greatest thing that ever happened to me. Uh, and but it was it was very similar. It was very short marriage. I pr- we probably stayed married for two years because the judge made us have a year of legal separation. Right. <laughs> So I will say our separation was longer than our marriage. And I got my divorce papers, you know, way longer than I thought it would take in New York State. So, yes, same, same exact, exact. Yeah, yeah. And it was tough. I wouldn't wish I wouldn't wish anybody going through a divorce. It was yeah. it was a tough. That's right. It was a tough, um, and, tough and thing I to maneuver. You, but I will say, so you had friendship before you got married. We dated and got married really fast. We were inseparable after our divorce. I mean, we were so inseparable that people couldn't tell we weren't a couple. Right. But we were not a couple. Our, our, I think our friendship got better when we weren't living in the same household and I wasn't telling him what to do, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think we just, it, it, it worked out much better not being a couple and being parents and friends. So, you know, a learning lesson. So you mentioned telling him what to do. Uh, 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 do you have a strong personality? So I'd like to say no, but um, <laughs> no one will believe that. No, you know, I'm... I can be definitive and I can absolutely be persuaded, but, but I know when we came here, I had, you know, I, I was getting a fresh start. I wasn't going to be the kid who was growing up in public housing on welfare. I was going to be whatever I felt like being. And I, I kind of had, I had a different set of ambitions, right? I wanted to take care of my daughter. I didn't want to, have to ask people for things. I didn't want to, have to rely on people. And I remember being a teenager and my mom wouldn't let me go to the, um, welfare recertification appointments because she also thought my sense of justice was too high. And I didn't like the way she was spoken to. I thought that people were mean to her. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so I came here thinking, like, I've got a real opportunity now to shed everything and become a different person. And so I think some of that didn't track with being a new person married in a new city. And so I bet you I was a bull in the china shop when I first got here, for sure. Because I was yeah, I wanted to settle in and I wanted to have our own place and I wanted to do things. So, so yes, kind of, I've learned to, um, I've absolutely learned to be a partner to people and to listen, but for sure, when I want to do something, I usually do it. <laughs> Don't tell anyone, my boss isn't listening to this. I hope um, <laughs> you place. No, so you mentioned that you could do anything you wanted to do. You came to New York, you could do anything you wanted, wanted to do. What did you want to do? So I had very small expectations. Um, I had read that if you lived in New York City and you made $50,000, you would do well in the early 90s. And I was like, okay, that's a goal. My goal is $50,000. And I wanted, I wasn't even thinking buying a place because we were going through a divorce, but I didn't want, my daughter's name is Akasha. I didn't want her to have to, you know, co-support me. And I didn't want her to not do things that kids her age should be doing. I wanted her to go to camp and I wanted her to you know, learn to swim, all the stuff I didn't get to do. So all my, all the things I wanted had nothing to do with me, everything had to do with Akasha. Like, I don't want her to be in a place where she doesn't feel she can make a decision for herself because that's how I always felt. So my, my goals were, they weren't lofty goals. Um, I wasn't looking for, you know, Gucci bags and flights to Paris. I was looking for like a nice bit of stability and I wanted to build a family here. Like I wanted to create the family system that I didn't have growing up. So, so I, I have friends who I've been friends with for 30 years now. That was my family. And so I, I, in that regard, I think I was totally successful, but I didn't know anything about this place. Um, I didn't I didn't even know you could get off the subway at 34th street, walk upstairs and walk to 42nd street. I thought you had to take the subway everywhere you wanted to go. So everything was a learning lesson. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think back now, I'm like, how did you not constantly be mugged? Um, But (laughs) people were very nice to me. So what can I say? (laughs) Okay. And your daughter, you said graduated from City College? She, uh, her undergraduates from our Colin Powell School, and she just this past year got her master's from our BIC program. Um, so she is, uh, you know, double, double graduate. She didn't start here. She started at Penn State and uh, she volunteered with me at an event with General Powell. And he said, where do you go to school? She said, um, Penn State. And he said, you know, you should go to my school. It's the best school for you. And she called me that weekend and I'd been trying for two years to get her to come home. And she said, no, mommy, can I come home and go to your school? So I was like, sure. But why all of a sudden? Oh, well, General Powell told me I should come to your school. <laughs> <laughs> like, all right. Well, whatever works. So double major here. Um, and she should time of her life here. And it, it was hard to understand this. Penn State wasn't building um, a New Yorker. Penn State's building Pennsylvanians. But Akasha wanted to be back in New York. City College built a New Yorker and I watched her blossom here and not be, she's unafraid of things. And I think City College gave that to her in a way that, you know, going away couldn't have given to her. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, apparently Colin Powell had that effect, huh? I, I, he did what I couldn't do. That's for sure. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I, uh, I never, I never had the, uh, the honor of meeting the gentleman, <laughs> but I uh, was always, you know, like everybody else, I was always impressed. Yeah him and his stature and it was a it was a horrible loss for everybody Absolutely. um he was a giant yeah. among among people right but uh yeah that's that's great that's great about that's great about your daughter the big the big program i i actually considered that too so i'm, I'm familiar it is, a, it is a great program for sure yeah but it, it was one of those things where I, I have to go part-time and i couldn't they right. don't have a part-time that's uh right thing that so it was like very intensive and I was like oh I don't know I can't I can't spare I have to have some flexibility because I, I still get called to to audition for stuff right mm-hmm. so I have to be prepared to do that but I can I can definitely relate so uh now your journey how how'd you get from there to here I never was without a mentor um in fact I just wrote to my high school history teacher because I was somewhere about a month ago and I knew the word antietam and I couldn't remember why I knew it. And then I remembered Mr. Lee from seventh grade teaching us something about the battle. And I, out of the blue wrote to him, I haven't talked to him since I was in seventh grade. And I said, you know, you're not going to believe this. I was in uh, Maryland and I was trying to explain to someone why I remember this thing. And it's because you taught it to me. Um, So I was never without somebody who looked out for me. 
um, kindergarten teacher looked out for me. We stayed friends until she passed away. My high school teacher has always looked out for me. My, my Marine Corps recruiter and I are still friends, um, even though he didn't acquire one recruit. And I came to New York and I got really lucky. Every single one of my bosses like saw something and said, you know, they would pay extra attention to me to make sure I didn't fall through the cracks. And so, so every step of the way, from my my early education to my teens to my 20s, my 30s, my 40s, and now now I just turned 50. I've never been without somebody mentoring me, even if I didn't see, um, even if I didn't know I was uh, setting out to find a mentor. Someone has parted with me, so I've been really lucky. Yeah, that does that does sound lucky. Uh, so what is the best advice you receive from your mentors? So the best advice I received was when I turned 25. And we're, you know, you're 25, so you're loud. You can be a little, you know, gregarious, not obnoxious, gregarious. <laughs> and I remember my boss coming over and, and she said to me, you know, you, you all think that you know everything now, but it's going to change for you when you turn 30. And as a woman, it's really going to change when you get to your 40s. And by 50, you're, the way you see yourself in the world is going to be totally different. And I was like, yeah, right. Okay, old lady, sure. Um, <laughs> who's going to be 50 in this room, right? She nailed it. I turned 30 and I had a different kind of set of like clar- clarifying moments. And on my 40th birthday, I came to work at City College. So so our, our president, who was then dean of the Colin Powell School, he and General Powell interviewed me 12 hours before my birthday and offered me the job. I drove home from D.C. having turned 40 and it felt like my whole life changed. And this year I just turned 50. And I will say the person I am today I wouldn't have thought that I could be this person 25 years ago. So I think that was the best bit of advice is just like to have a long, a long view of yourself. And I didn't, I wasn't thinking a long view. I was thinking like, when's the next party? What's this? What am I going to do here? And she taught me to slow down and think about a long, a long perspective of your life and how you're going to be. So that has changed everything about me. Mm, okay. And what I, what I wanted to ask you was that word that you mentioned. I never heard it before. Say that word again. Which one? <laughs> and, and the one about and, from- and Tia Tim. And it was the, it was the defining battle of the Civil War where an outnumbered um, it was it was a lopsided battle and um, it changed the shape of Lincoln's uh, trajectory. And, and I couldn't remember for the life of me. I was in a it was in a hotel and they had a room named Antia Tim. And I was just like, what is that? What is that? And as soon as I looked it up. Mr. Lee's words came back to me out of nowhere, right? I'm not in seventh grade anymore. And, you know, he's a lifelong educator. And so whatever he taught me in seventh grade clearly stuck because I remembered who it was. And when I reached out, and I have to tell you, I reached out thinking there's no way this man's going to remember me. So I kind of re introed myself to him. He said he'd never forgotten me. He'd never forgotten me in class. He didn't forget what I wrote about. I thought, well, that's that's outrageous, right? <laughs> lifelong educator. So... Wow. Okay. You triggered a thought in my mind. I figure. I think I have to tell you this. So when I came, when I came back to college after 32 years, I was requesting to be a theater major because I had, you know, because I'm a professional actor and all kinds of whatever. And Melissa Odin yes. said, you don't want to be a theater major because you could teach those classes. Yes. She said, you should consider being a black studies major. Good for her. Good and for her. I never met Melissa Odin in person. I've never seen her in person. To Is this that point. right? Oh. Never seen her in person. Only on Zoom. Okay. Didn't know her from anything. And I said, well, you know, I've never really been that woke. I'm not a, I'm not a, you know, protest guy or anything like that. But if it'll help me get my degree, I, I'll do it. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. And I wasn't excited about it, wasn't enthused, nothing. And the her recommendation changed my life. It changed my life. It it, it's the reason I'm here interviewing you now. It's the reason I'm in City College Grad School. It's it's everything. And I remember speaking of antentium, that's the word, antentium. Yes. Last year, November, I was in a black studies class on Zoom because the school campus was closed. And the professor said a word in regular conversation during the lecture. She said, manumission. 
And I said, excuse me, professor, you just said a word I never heard of in my life. What's that word again? And she said, man, your mission. And she went on to explain. And it, it fired up my spirit because I was like, at my age, why am I hearing that word for the first time in my life? And I'm a stand-up comic. I performed, I performed at Radio City. I opened for Patti LaBelle. I performed, I opened for for BB King at at you know at at BB King's. I, I performed with Al Green. I performed in front of tens of thousands of black audiences, African American audiences. And I said to myself, if I never heard that word before, I know most of those people that I performed for never heard the word because I was a kid that showed up in class. I didn't play hooky and miss lessons. So if they taught it, I would have learned it. And that began the passion, the fire. But it, it was it was amazing. Kudos to to the to Melissa. Kudos to her directing a guy she never met before to the major. Uh, kudos to to, you know, the history, our history. Kudos to City College. Uh, like I'm I'm I rock with y'all like I'm down like I'm I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> the, only, the only reason I'm going to go somewhere is because I'm go for, going for my Ph.D., and y'all don't have that major. There's no Africana studies major at City College. But if there was, y'all would never get rid of me, right? Uh, but I'm I'm all in. I'm all in, and I and I and I admire you, and I admire I admire your your passion and your story and your journey and whatever. So we talked about mentorship, tutoring. Did you did you were you one of the kids that needed a tutor, or were you one of the kids that was a tutor? So I will tell you, I was a crossing guard and a tutor um, and a hall <laughs> monitor. Um, so <laughs> when you, you asked me earlier, my hobbies were, and um, now you know what they were. Um, so I, I was a tutor. I tutored, um, I tutored at ESL classes um, from seventh grade through high school. I tutored in college. Um, and I actually tutored when I first came here. It was one of the first um, side gigs that I took, um, tutoring women who wanted to pass their ESL exam to do English language classes. So. So yep. I don't know. I don't know. When, 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 it was a we crossing kids, guard, right? It's a crossing guard that did you in. I knew it. <laughs> when we were kids, there was this movie called Revenge of the Nerd. Do you remember That's that? It. Word? I, that was me. That I, I, can, I yes. <laughs> you, just, you just scored the nerd trifecta I know. I just know. now. You I said know. crossing guard, yep. <laughs> tutor, yep. and hall monitor. Absolutely. <laughs> Teachers trusted me to get kids safely across the street in my own grade, by the way. And they trusted me to make sure they got to the bathroom okay. And I think I did a pretty decent job. <laughs> wow. Yes, you you yeah. definitely you definitely hit the trifecta on that one. <laughs> when did you turn cool? I don't, I have, I'm waiting. I can't I can't wait for it to happen. I, they keep telling me it's coming. I'm just waiting and waiting. So. Nah, hold up, hold up now. <laughs> so I, I show up at the 175th gala to see the movie. Yes. And every that time the, they, movie, the movie that you made a breakout hit, I just want to be really clear. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. It was it was my pleasure being a, being a part of it. But every time they mentioned your name. A round of applause erupted like. And all I'm thinking, because I, <laughs> I heard the name, but I never met you before, but they mentioned your name like. They they responded like they had just mentioned Beyonce. <laughs> so there's something cool about you. There's something magnetic about you and the energy you give off and the way you inspire people. So for real, when did that happen? When did you did you ever notice that happen? Uh, no, no, I did not. But I will I will say one thing. I've always worked in places where I, I did not look like anyone else. Um, so I worked in places where, where people would ask me the oddest questions about my background. Um, they'd want to touch my hair. Um, they'd want to ask me if I knew that I looked more, you know, do, do you realize you look more white when you wear your hair straight? Like those are the kind of questions that I got on a daily basis. And then I got here. Nobody cared what I looked like. Nobody cared what my hair looked like. They didn't care how I dressed. Um, they only cared that I had a commitment to city college. And I think if, if there's not a, not necessarily cool, but when I got more confident and more, um, more assured that I wasn't in the wrong space. It's it's the past 11 years here at City College for sure. Absolutely. 
So you you seriously don't know how cool you are right now. <laughs> no, but I'm I'm happy to keep talking about it until I absorb it into my my the fibers <laughs> of my being. Absolutely. No, is your daughter? I, 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 she's very cool. I wish I was <laughs> half as cool as her. She walks in the room. People want to talk with her. People want to tell her their stories. Um, and she's a good listener, which is great. She's a good person. Like I'd be friends with her even if I didn't give birth to her. But but we're not we're not the same level of 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 cool at, at all at all. Um, no no I you know if, if I had my way I would work by myself I'd keep my head down I'd be in books all night long and I'd, I'd be okay with that and you know it wasn't always like that but you know I'm a natural homebody and I think growing up I was always really protective of people not knowing how bad my home life was mm-hmm. so. So I was always quiet, which is probably why I was a hall monitor. Because what are you going to say in the hall? <laughs> right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. So you've been, at, you've been at City College for how long? This is my 11th year. 11th year. How many, how much upward mobility have you achieved? Like you didn't apply. This isn't the job that, that Cola Powell and Vincent Boudreaux hired you for. No, not on any level. Um, I I thought I was lucky to get an interview and I thought there was no way that I would get hired for this job. I thought when I applied, the whole city would want this job and they would find someone better. And I would have totally understood that. Um, and when I went down to meet General Powell, he his question to me, the final question was, why should we hire you? And I my only answer that, that I had was, if you want someone who's going to just raise money to open your school, that's not me. If you want someone who's going to be thinking about your school's growth over 10, 20, 30 years then that's me. But I don't have an interest in coming in, hitting a campaign goal and then leaving. And, and I meant that. I really did mean that you have to be in it for the long haul. Um, but no, this job here, in fact, I cried when, um, so I was so thrilled when Vince became um, interim president. And I was not thrilled when he asked me to become interim vice president. Um, so I actually carried two jobs. I had the interim vice president title and I kept my Colin Powell school job because Joan Powell asked me to. And then when Vince became president and he said, I'd like you to stay on in your new position, um, I cried and I said, no. And then he said, it's not a question. I was like, (laughs) (laughs) Um, and I'm also in an office that I had vowed I'd never work in. I I remember saying to the past president, you couldn't pay me to work in Shepherd Hall. And now 65 people work for me. So I don't know, sir. (laughs) I don't know. But this is not your, but it is the job because the job was student success and the job was to talk to people about the greatness of this campus. So technically, I guess it's the same job. Just, mm. just for eight schools and divisions, not one, so. Mm. So people tapped you to uh, to rise and you rose. I, and I, I try to keep up. You know, I got a great boss um, who, he wakes up every day, he falls asleep every day thinking about City College. This is, this is his home, this, these are, like this is his family. Um, and the team we have around us, most of my colleagues are either my former interns, they're children of City College graduates, they're parents of City College graduates, or they are current City College students. So they think about this place much different than I think um, than I think any other team in any other place would think about their their jobs. And, and I just love this place. I love everything about it, you know. And and I still get to have my sense of justice, right? <laughs> I still get to find ways to say to the country you're not paying attention to the gem that is city college. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so at the end of the day, I was, I was right to keep the sense of justice. It is not, it has not failed me. So. <laughs> right. Right. So, so uh, you were a tutor. Yep. You, you had several mentors organically. Yep. What is the best advice you've received? In my whole life, the best advice I ever received from anybody um, well, there's two things. Akasha, when she was about seven, said, um, and I was just coming out of the divorce, so it was it was chaotic, right? Um, and I was here without my own family, except the family I'd built. She said to me, you know, you never listen. And, and that kind of gave me pause because I was so busy parenting her. I didn't think I had to listen to what, like I wasn't listening to her. I was parenting. Um, so that slowed me down a little bit. And I'm actually divorced twice. And I went to therapy this after the second divorce. And I remember my therapist said, you know, are you here to save your marriage? And I said, no, I'm here to figure out why I slept on my couch for two years. Um, and just, she said, okay, let's figure it out together. And about two years in, she said to me, you know, if you learn to step out of things, 
people will learn to do the things they're supposed to, but you're so busy fixing things that they don't have to get better at something. What a life lesson. I had no idea that, A, I didn't know anybody knew I was doing it, but me. Um, and I didn't know that I was, I was actually hurting people and hurting myself by constantly trying to solve for problems before somebody else had a chance to solve for them. I take that with me every day and I use it in my office. I use it at home. I use it in my personal relationships. And I really try to get out of people's way when it's time for them to do the next big thing for themselves. It's hard. I'm a, I'm a firstborn Leo. That's very hard to uh, step back and let someone else do things, you know, so. Now, now is that, 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 that's powerful. That's powerful. Uh, is, but is that a, is that advice or a diagnosis? Like <laughs> which one? Is so, that? you know, I went to see a social worker because they don't diagnose. They, um, they partner with you. And, okay. and, you know, the difference between a psychologist, a social worker, and a psychiatrist, one can do, can do prescriptions, one diagnosis, and one sits there with you and lets you kind of stumble into your own uh, fallacies without them pushing you into it. So, so she was trying to help me figure out that I could take myself to Paris while my sister was struggling with something, while my boyfriend was complaining about something, and while Akash was going to college, that maybe they didn't all need me to sit in New York while they were lamenting. I, could, I They could lament while I was in Paris. And you know what? She was 100% right. They lamented for seven days. I had Paris for seven days. Everybody won at the end. So, Outstanding. Outstanding. Okay. So uh, we're, coming, we're coming to the end. We're coming to close. What is the best advice you have to offer to your younger self, to young people, whatever you think? I just think if you know something's wrong, your obligation is to fix it. And if you don't have expertise now, you have to acquire expertise to fix that thing. So everyone said to me, your sense of justice is too high. What they were saying was you can't fix things that are broken. And I don't think that's true. I, mm. I disagree with that wholeheartedly. And I, and I actually think people pick City College because they've identified a problem and City College is the place they've identified to help them solve how to get a fix to that problem. I think that's what makes us different. Like, you know, I, I have this game I play with people. I say, tell me about City College. Don't use the word diversity. Don't tell me we're diverse. Tell me something else. People struggle with that. But I know that people pick City College because there's a confidence that you can solve for big life challenges here in a way that you can't do other places. And part of it is, yes, it's because we're diverse. And part of it is that's the history of City College. So that's why I tell everybody, like, don't let someone tell your sense of justice is too high. If you see it wrong, um, you have to fix it. Um, okay. You're gonna get tired and you're going to get bags into your eyes, but it's okay. <laughs> It'll get fixed. Right, right. Okay. So my final question for you. You, you, you told me who you are, uh, where you're from, your, your life journey, and it was all beautiful. Thank you. And thank you again for, for taking the time out to join me in this. I feel, I absolutely feel honored. I, I'm thank grateful. You. I know Gary, Gary Rifkin, the, the executive director, I know he's very appreciative and the whole, but we welcome you. Thank you. But uh, so we talked about a lot of things. Did we leave anything out? So one thing I skipped over, we talked about my shyness. We talked about my, my, my nerd. Um, I grew in a household with really severe mental and physical abuse. And so, so there's a reason I have a sense of justice, right? So there's a reason that I'm always thinking like, how can you help someone else? And I think it stems from the fact that my mom couldn't help herself with her behavior. So like as an adult, I understand how she was now in a way I couldn't as a child. I think we get stuck sometimes thinking that our, our early childhood experiences have to dictate every single thing else that we do in life. And just like you and I, with a word that we didn't necessarily recognize, you can change everything about yourself. You can have a fresh start literally every day if you need it. And I just think we forget that sometimes. And so I, I always remind people of this, that the thing you did yesterday doesn't have to be what you do next week. And you get to decide you know, take it in small chunks. Um, you know, I'm back in school now as an adult and you're in school as an adult. That can be scary, but you still got to do it if you want to do the next thing. So pe people get stuck and we have to help them get unstuck sometimes.